Welcome back, everyone. Today we are talking about government food guidance in Canada. And likely at some point, I wouldn't be surprised if it was back when you were in primary school, you would have had health class where you talked about Canada's food guide. Well, there's been a lot of evolution of Canada's food guide over the years, and it's culminated in the most recent food guide, which was published in 2019. And I, and I, uh, as part of our discussion on understanding uh, the food manufacturing sector's role in nutrition, I felt it was uh, worthwhile to do a bit of a dive into the Canada's Food Guide. Uh, this week I've provided you with a few different resources. Uh, in 2019, to be quite frank, uh, the, the public media put out some really good content and it's worth taking a look at that. And so I'll be sharing that with you in the Blackboard website, but uh, in that content, there wasn't a lot of discussion about the history of government food guidance in Canada and its evolution over time based off of the different political and social influences that were going on. So often when we think about the scientific community and how we set guidance, we think, well, the politicians listen to the scientists, it's clear cut, it's and it's not. To be quite honest, any time some sort of guidance comes into play that helps um, build protections for the population, there's all sorts of different influences at play, whether those are uh, social uh, or social influences, whether those are scientific influences, whether they're political influences, whether they're corporate interests. And the food guidance in Canada is a great example of that, and we can see some of the different influences over time. So I think it's worth having that sort of discussion to see how the sociopolitical and uh, social environments have influenced our food guidance in Canada over time, because inevitably, if you want to be in this sector, you will see more changes in the future these guidance documents are changing usually every five, 10 years, and you will see more changes. Are you going to be able to predict what sorts of changes are coming based off of the trends that you're seeing or the, the political movements that you're seeing? So let's jump in here. So after this video, you'll be able to discuss the history of food guidance in Canada. You'll interpret the political and scientific influences that have shaped food guidance over the past century. We'll discuss the transition from prescriptive macronutrient-centered food guidance to lifestyle-oriented food guidance, and we'll debate some of the challenges of food guidance from uh, different world viewpoints. So let's just jump in here. Food guidance in Canada started back in 1942, and as you know, uh, that was the period of World War II. And as such, Canada's official food rules were defined by the fact that two key factors were at play. One was the fact that in the hiring of armed forces recruitment, they were finding uh, reasonably, reasonably high levels of malnutrition within the general population, such that these individuals who were experiencing malnutrition, either during childhood or during adolescence, um, that prime period of growth and development right before that prime period for armed forces recruitment in early adulthood, um, that lack of nutrition led to um, insufficiency for uh, the physical testing that was required by the armed forces at this period. The other piece of the puzzle was that at this period of time, there were rationing programs at play in that the Canadian government was um, providing ration tickets or ration books to households so that they could access certain trade goods or commodities at any period of time. And, and, because so much of the, the commodity production in Canada at that time was being sent to the, the front lines for the purposes of um, feeding the armed forces, but also providing food aid to countries that had been devastated by the World War, food rationing limited supply to different households. And so the government needed to ensure that there was going to be adequate distribution and by having a food rule system, 
they were able to make sure that there was going to be adequate um, adequate distribution and even uh, even distribution. So you'll notice here they're using uh, pints. Pint is uh, approximately two cups. So one cup of milk. Children would be having one pint or approximately two cups. Add cheese is available. Uh, fruits. No, tomatoes are classified as a fruit here. Um, and tomatoes being a domestically produced product, they were encouraging consumption of tomatoes. And it was something that was readily available canned. Citrus fruit or tomato or citrus fruit juices, other fruits, vegetables, and so on. Um, dried fruits, as is mentioned here. And again, at this point in time, refrigeration technology was becoming more commonplace, but it was not a universal at this period that um, not everyone had mechanical refrigeration in their homes. Vegetables. Oh, note the emphasis of potatoes. That's a kind of uh, interesting too, because again, potatoes being a domestically produced crop. Two servings daily of vegetables, pref preferably leafy green or yellow and frequently raw. Cereals and bread, one serving of a whole grain cereal and four to six slices of bread, brown or white. Meat, fish, etc. One serving a day of meat, fish or meat substitutes with um, liver, heart or kidney once a week. Eggs, at least three or four weekly. Eat these foods first and then add other foods as you wish. And so you see it's a very minimum standard that um, this is not intended for on a daily basis. This is intended uh, in some respects distributed over a weekly basis. And it reflects on the fact that um, if you're lacking one nutrient for one day, it, uh, your body is not going to go in deficiency state. Whereas if you're lacking uh, nutrient uh, in sequence over a long period of time, then your body can go into deficiency state. But one day missing something is not going to get you there. Um, very prescriptive, very focused on uh, discrete commodities. Then we were moving into 1946. There's still rationing going on, but the war has ended at this period of time. And you're starting to see a little bit of lightheartedness uh, through the use of cartoons. And we see these vegetables uh, with little arms and legs here, almost like cartoons. Um, there was a lot of messaging going on that food was still being urgently needed in um, different zones of the world that were devastated by the war effort. And so um, do your bit for hungry humanity by conserving food, buy less, use, use less, waste nothing. Um, the the uh, Quantities that they're recommending here are still very focused on domestic production within Canada. Uh, trade of uh, food commodities was still limited. There was some, but more emphasis on uh, domestic production. And so emphasis on domestic uh, ingredients and domestic food products. Um, again, not a lot of context about how these foods are being presented within a meal. Let's jump forward to 1949. Now we're starting to switch from a rationing message to a wellness message. And we're starting to see the, some of the first um, guidance from the department. At this point, it was the Department of National Health and uh, Welfare. The first messages were starting to come up about overconsumption because we went at this period of time from um, rationing and um, minimized access to certain food commodities to free access to food commodities. And we also saw a large um, increase in uh, manufacturing and industrialism within Canada and people's uh, economic well-being increased. And as such, they had more disposable income and they had more access to being able to buy quality food. And so people started to eat more and you would start to see aspects of health related to obesity and overconsumption. So we still see emphasis on potatoes. We still see emphasis on citrus fruit and tomatoes as uh, dominant fruits. The number of servings that are here are very limited. You see in terms of fruits and vegetables, at least one serving of potatoes and two servings of vegetables. And we'll contrast that when we get to the 90s and the early 2000s, we're pushing up um, in, in terms of five to 12 servings of fruits and vegetables. And in terms of grain, here they're saying one serving of whole grain cereal and at least four slices of bread. Um, we're pushing into five to 12 servings of bread. And you could almost argue that the, the later guidance in the 
90s and 2000s were almost uh, prescribing overconsumption of food. Um, so switch in the rules. Something else that was interesting in this transition is that you think about the home economics message. Home economics was the study of, of meals and preparation and the study of maintaining the home lifestyle in a, in a um, economical and genteel way. And you had a lot of women at home who wanted to be integrating entertainment. Well, they, they turned the food guide into what looked like a meal, uh, or not a meal, a menu for fine dining almost. And so they're suggesting this, this uh, fine dining menu here with a, a suggested breakfast with citrus fruit, with whole grain cereal, with milk, with uh, bread, with fortified margarine, hmm, eggs or other protein foods as desired, and beverage milk for children. Dinner at noon or at night with meat, fish, or poultry, potatoes, other vegetables, bread, fruits, fruit desserts, and beverage milk for children. And supper for uh, supper or lunch, the light, the lighter of the meal. And in some in some households, dinner would be the main meal, and it would be served at noon, um, not just on weekends, but throughout the week. That people would go home and have a full meal in the middle of the day, and then have a light meal in the evening. Um, but supper or lunch, uh, the lighter meal of the day, cheese, egg, or other protein food, vegetable, bread, fortified margarine, or butter, dessert, and beverage milk. Um, but a very, very Eurocentric meal planning, meat, potato, vegetable on the plate. And not a lot of acknowledgement of the increasing multiculturalism that was starting to occur within Canada. And no, no acknowledgement whatsoever of... Uh, First Nations or Inuit or other um, traditional meal practices that came from the land. Now we're jumping, there was a bit of a lull and then we see the next transition in 1961 and we see still a big emphasis on potatoes, <laughs> hey, because it's domestic, but we do not see that same emphasis as before on uh, tomato, uh, tomato products as before. Um, the amount of milk has increased. We're now looking at two and a half cups. For adolescents, four cups. That would be the equivalent of two pints. For adults, we're looking at almost a pint. And for uh, women who are uh, expectant mothers, uh, four cups. We also see that transition. We're no, we're no longer using pints and quarts as uh, the household measures. We're using cups. Um, what a serving is, though, is still somewhat vague. Meat and fish, we're still looking at one serving per day. And we're seeing a free substitution. Eggs, cheese, dried beans, or peas may be used in the place of meat. And it's one serving. It's one serving. That, that's really, really fascinating. Uh, same, with, same with bread. We're not seeing the same number of discrete uh, number of servings. It says consume at least one serving of whole grain cereal. And with fruits and vegetables, at least two servings of fruit or two servings of vegetables. When we get again, when we get to the 90s, we're looking at five to 12 servings. And my key question is, we're through the use of food rules, were we over prescribing and over consuming food? Next jump would be 1977. We're starting to get into a lot more graphical uh, interpretation, but we're seeing also a lot more movement towards scientific eating and a big emphasis on macronutrients. So carbohydrates, protein, uh, fats, um, sugars, fiber, etc. This is also the beginning of the period of nutrition labeling. And while at this point in time it wasn't mandatory, food companies were starting to see the value of including food uh, nutrition labeling on packages. We're also seeing, in, uh, in some cases, the, the opening up of wording on alternative foods, so milk and milk products, meat and alternates, uh, bread and cereals um, with whole grain and or enriched, and fruits and vegetables were finally grouped together. So we're seeing a slight transition. Meat and alternates were up to two servings. Now we're up to two to three, three to four servings, and three to five servings of bread. So we went from um, lower amounts of servings to increasing the amount of servings. 
Jumping forward into 1982, it doesn't look like a big difference, but within a lot of the guidance documentation, we started to see um, conversations about the role of fat in cardiovascular disease and increasing obesity in the population. That um, in the 1980s, we saw a, a really quite dramatic increase in obesity. And so you started to see wording about variety, energy balance, and moderation uh, directly included in the food guidance. The amount of servings is creeping up. Now we're, now the next jump is 1992, and the idea being a spectrum of um, different food products. We're starting to see uh, it's still very much a commodity-based and meal program, but that said, you can start to see some of the first influences of multiculturalism integrated into the food guide. You can see um, a bowl of rice with a pair of chopsticks. You can see pita bread. And so there's a beginning acknowledgement of the fact that multiculturalism exists in Canada and um, that the food practices that have been demonstrated by these food guides have been overwhelmingly Eurocentric to this point. The thing is, they're still classifying foods by commodity and macronutrient, and you still see a dominance of grain products in terms of the number of servings. Check this out. The number of grain products uh, shifted dramatically from, we saw uh, some uh, back in the 60s where we're looking at a minimum of one serving, and we saw two, uh, two fruit and two vegetables, so four servings. Now we're at five to 10 servings and five to 12 servings of grain products. Meat and alternates, we had one serving previously, and now we're up to two to three. And one could say that these rules have been prescribing and, and, and I know for me as a middle-aged woman, do I need to eat 12 slices of bread per day? Not really. Um, do I even need to eat five servings per day? I don't think so. I think there is, there's acknowledgement of the fact that different people need different amounts of foods. And so when they're putting out those prescriptive, an adult needs to eat this much, a sedentary adult most certainly does not need to eat the same amount as a physically active adult who is involved in either high amounts of sports or physical labor as part of their work. Um, but we are starting to see acknowledgement of the fact that different people need different amounts and not just you are an adult or you are an adolescent or you are a child or you are a pregnant or expecting mother or someone who's uh, breastfeeding. Now suddenly there's acknowledgement about the difference in um, the difference in physical activity that's that's seen by different people. Oh, and now we're switching up to 2007. And note, there's a switch dominance of fruits and vegetables as uh, compared to grains and cereals. Fruits and vegetables used to be line number two, and now it is the first line in terms of the spectrum. You'll also see that processed fruits and vegetables are in there. So frozen spinach, frozen green beans, canned tomatoes, they're linked in there. We've, we see some couscous in here. We see some wild rice. And so there's acknowledgement. Uh, we see kefir and tofu and um, fortified soy beverage. <laughs> had to use that terminology. <laughs> but uh, we are starting to see um, broader uh, integration of multicultural and First Nations interpretations of the food guides. And there were actual publications for the first time in other languages, which... Um, was respectful in 2007 also there was the um there were actual first nations uh food guide wheels following the medicine wheel practice of many of the uh dif diverse first nations across canada that it started to directly integrate country food as part of the holistic food challenge expecting that for example uh some of the remote First Nations in Northern Canada to be getting frozen green beans and fresh uh, bell peppers is unrealistic, whereas there are plenty of country foods that are readily available um, and expecting that this is the framework that everyone needs to eat is, is uh, somewhat prejudiced, that within the global context of Canada and within the traditional context of Canada, there have been many diets that have 
provided good nutrition, expecting that it all comes from the industrialized sector is somewhat false. Um, 2007 was also a real uh, game changer in terms of the use of internet technology for disseminating uh, nutrition information. So there was a lot more use of mobile apps, online tools, websites, um, quizzes, um, all sorts of different interfaces for people to engage with the content. And then we jumped to 2019, and this was a bit of a radical shift. And again, as I mentioned, I'm sharing some information with you from the public media in 2019, because it wasn't that long ago. But um, the big shift that occurred in 2019 was we went away from everything being a commodity, uh, fruits and vegetables, grains, meat and alternatives and so on, to thinking more about meal composition and getting away from that prescriptive, you must eat five servings to 12 servings of grain every day. Instead, the emphasis on eating whole meals. And so huge emphasis on plant-based foods um, and a lot less prescriptive on the you should eat so many servings and one serving is this many ounces or this many cups or this many grams or this many. Instead, it's focused on how do you feel? And so the second piece of the puzzle is all of these other behavioral aspects. So this is a big shift in 2019 towards, and the other food guides had behavioral considerations, but now the acknowledgement is that a lot of the behaviors and issues related to overconsumption or poor eating habits come from lack of mindfulness. The, the piece of the puzzle that I feel is not integrated here are what are called the social determinants of health. And social determinants of health deserves its own complete, um, its own complete slideshow for you. But the, the principle of social determinants of health are that things like um, economic status or poverty access to housing, access to infrastructure within the housing, access to um, good healthcare services, access to uh, good transit, access to grocery stores are also good indicators of someone's health and wellness status. And the 2019 guide somewhat ignores those social determinants of health. Um, it does focus on mindfulness and a lot of the behavioral aspects. So be mindful of your eating habits. So stop eating when you are full. They do suggest that people should cook more often. Again, one of those social determinants of health is it, it, this comes with the assumption that cook more often. You live in a house where you have cooking material, you have pots and pans, you have a stove that works. Not everyone has that. Um, there are many people who are living in housing situations where they don't have cooking infrastructure. Um, enjoy your food, eat meals with others, be mindful of your eating habits. Well, those are all um, under the premise that people have a lot of time and have a lot of um, freedom to be able to participate in these sorts of activities. Uh, many people, uh, again, those social determinants of health, if you are a uh, let's say a young adult trying to make a go at it, you are living in a, uh, let's say, a rooming house with a few other people and you don't have uh, traditional access to a kitchen or refrigerator or freezing space. Um, perhaps uh, you are working a gig type job. You might not have the chance to participate in enjoying your food or being mindful or eating meals with others or cooking more often. Um, many times the advice that's given, I think of uh, one of the one of the uh, pieces of um, one of the documentaries that I'm going to share with you is from the CBC Nature of Things, and I find that it's quite funny that all of these, uh, pardon me, but middle-aged, affluent, educated men are out there saying, "Well, don't eat the processed cheese; eat the uh, natural aged cheddar." And that's all very fine and good. If you have the money to pay for something that costs perhaps five or six times the cost per gram of the other product, um, if you are a low income person, you need to feed your kids and you don't necessarily have the economic ability to go and pay for 
all of these wonderful um, health conferring foods. There are better ways of doing it, but it also implies that you have the time to cook and you have the infrastructure to freeze and store large amounts of food. And again, not everyone does. And so those social determinants of health, I think, are there's still a lot of broad assumptions that people enjoy cooking, that people enjoy um, and have access to all that infrastructure. Um, these three lines down here, they're starting to have conversations about the role of marketing and processing in the industry. So use food labels. We've been on an exploration of how food labels are uh, generated for food products. And food labels do confer a lot of information about the quality of that food product and the nutritional delivery that it can have. Limit highly processed foods. And I will have a second follow-up uh, slideshow talking about what Health Canada's definition of highly processed excuse me, highly processed foods are. And in many cases, uh, the, the terminologies that they use that define highly processed foods are, in my opinion, somewhat, somewhat misleading. So for example, they have a pizza down here. A flatbread pizza, when done right, can be an incredibly nutritious product and can, can uh, confer a lot of nutrition in an easy and portable uh, means. But they make a lot of broad assumptions that pizza or canned sodas or baked goods are all negatives and only home prepared food products are healthful. Highly processed foods have a really important role to play in many people's lives. I think of um, many people who are disabled or elderly who take advantage of highly processed foods to be able to get quality nutrition because they do not have the manual dexterity to be cooking or the capability of um, cooking in a safe environment on a daily basis, whereas microwaving a meal for them is a means of independence. And in other cases, highly processed foods are an important gateway for um, young adolescents to be able to prepare meals for themselves. Um, I think of many young adolescents being able to have the independence of finding uh, simple to prepare food products allows one, their parents to be able to participate in the workforce freely and it gives them the independence to pre uh, prepare meals on behalf of their family and their uh, perhaps their younger siblings. Highly processed foods too are, are they're time savers. Very, we often think about, oops, pardon me, we often think about some of these food products that appear to be minimally processed, but actually have a lot of different processing steps involved. And from my perspective, would be considered highly processed foods. For example, if you were to buy, let's say you've got that salad um, in a bag coming from your grocery retailer, there's a lot of processing that's going on there. A lot of, a lot of um, different um, process controls within that product, a lot of different uh, processing aids, uh, different chemicals that would be helping manage the food safety component of that. And some of the judgments that have been made about the nature of processed foods, especially highly processed foods, I think are a bit hasty. This one, uh, marketing can influence your food choices. This one's a really interesting one because, again, uh, marketing can influence your food choices. And there is an important role for marketing to play in terms of helping drive economic sustainability for food companies. Um, but we do notice that it's, it's not fruits and vegetables. It's not commodity products that have a lot of the marketing. It's usually the highly processed foods that have a lot of the marketing behind them. And so I think that's where Health Canada's angle is coming from, saying, wait a second, we aren't out there advertising carrots and tomatoes and uh, peaches. We're out there advertising uh, sugar cereal and frozen pizza. And so I, I, I get where they're coming from from this perspective. But when we get into being able to make health claims, in some respects, the rules that allow for marketing have have been stilted against many of these um, minimally processed products to be able to make the sorts of claims that they'd like to use for a marketing perspective. Just a quick summary here. So rules frameworks, um, in some respects, can provide good external motivation. So it gives you a goal or a uh, 
something to aspire towards, but it can also be a negative external motivator. So if you're out there saying, well, I can never meet these rules, I can't do it, it's too hard, it's too complicated, it can become a negative motivator and and make you feel defeated before you even try. And that's one of the big challenges behind rules or guidance frameworks, that when taken in the right perspective, they are very motivating and can provide useful information, but they can also become a negative and and help uh, reinforce stereotyping of different uh, food-based behaviors. For example, the just that guidance about avoiding uh, processed food, I, uh, I'm going to speak anecdotally here, but my mother has Alzheimer's and for her, being able to access frozen meals is a really important thing. If she were to read the food guide, she would look at it and go, well, wait a second, I'm not eating healthy. I'm eating all frozen meals here. Um, this is a big negative external motivator and would give a person a sense of discouragement about their ability to uh, make healthy choices. The guidance documents, even the most recent ones, still assume that people enjoy food preparation. And there are many people who would rather not engage in food preparation. They see it as one of those economic factors where they could use their time more effectively for other um, activities, whether those are um, economic activities or leisure activities. Not everyone enjoys cooking. Not everyone has the time or the resources or the skills to be able to cook. And uh, the guidance still makes the assumption that Everyone likes to cook and everyone has kitchens, everyone has all sorts of kitchen appliances and has the ability, if they don't have those appliances, to go out and invest in them. And to make the assumption that someone can put down $100 on an Instapot or a microwave oven so that they can uh, make all of these different meals is a really, really broad assumption. There is that demonization of uh, processed and prepared foods, and many processed and prepared foods have very good nutritional quality, and there's lots of them that don't, but demonizing and grouping them all together, I don't think serves, I don't think it serves people well. Last but not least, there's better reflection of multicultural values and integration of uh, First Nations foodways, but there's still a long way to go. And one thing that we'll notice when we look at the lists of uh, minimally and um, maximally food uh, or processed foods, some of the different traditional food ways that have been um, incorporated by um, both First Nations here in Canada, but also other global Indigenous populations, many of those traditional food ways, when you really think about it, um, are integrating highly processed uh, methodologies. So for example, smoking of meat is considered a highly processed product whereas smoking of meat is an extremely important traditional food way for many First Nations. And it's, it's somewhat misleading when, when you see this sort of contradiction within the documentation. So that was our journey of looking at the history of the different food guides in Canada. And I'm going to encourage those of you who are following along with the uh, Nutrition for Food Technology course to take a look at some of the documentaries that I'm going to share with you and some of the um, articles that were out uh, writing about the different food guides at the time. I've also shared with you some information about the different food guide systems around the world so that perhaps you can go and explore some of the global influences on food guides, um, perhaps from your home country or explore some of the countries that are of interest to you to, uh, to see how their governments are interpreting this. All right, so if you have questions, you know where to find me. Take care and we will talk to you again real soon.